<laughs> Thank you, Graham. Thank you for inviting me, and uh, and uh, good morning, everybody. It's nice to be amongst uh, a group of people that doesn't want to kill me or sue me. Um, uh, I'm told I've got quite a lot of time, an hour or so, um, if I need it, and I can easily talk for an hour about guns. It's, it's no difficulty at all. Um, so when I see you start shifting in your seat, I'll know it's probably time to, uh, to shut up. But there are three areas of, um, or three topic uh, areas that I thought I might uh, talk about. One is, a bit, I'd get a bit philosophical to start with, which is, uh, why, will, why do we defend gun ownership? Why are we all here um, arguing for the, the, um, uh, our rights to own guns? What's, what's behind it? Um, a bit of a chat about why gun control is growing, what's, uh, what's prompting that, and then what can be done about it? What, what could we do each individually and collectively uh, in order to promote our, our right to own guns? And then perhaps a little bit of a chat about um, what I've been concentrating on in the Senate uh, in my activities and uh, um, I think some of you might be interested in a certain Green Senator's legal case. Um, <coughs> but why do, we, why do we defend gun ownership? The fairly simple starting point is often just because it's a legitimate sport and and legitimate hunting. As a sport, shooting has been around ever since guns were invented. There were people trying to shoot straight and out, outdo each other at shooting straight ever since guns existed. And, gun, and shooting uh, guns has been in the modern Olympics ever since the modern Olympics has existed. It was one of the original sports, as a matter of fact. And of course, hunting for food is thousands of years old. There's nothing unusual about that at all. So we, we would, I would argue, well, we're entitled to have guns on the basis of legitimacy. Shooting is a legitimate sport, and hunting is a cultural, um, historical, legitimate for all sorts of reasons. We would then argue, well, we're doing no harm. We're not hurting anybody by shooting and hunting. We're law-abiding. And... The laws are aimed at the wrong people. Criminals who do do harm with guns don't obey the laws anyway. So what's the point of harassing people like us um, when, uh, when we're not the ones who are uh, responsible for the misuse of guns? So all of that is fine. It's, it's, it's an argument you hear a lot. Uh, people come into shooting without a strong philosophical uh, basis for their, for their interest in shooting. They just get into it because they think it's fun or because they think they're good at it or their friends are into it or whatever. And then somebody says, but, you know, you're a murderer in waiting. <coughs> and, and then they think, hang on a minute, I'm not. And then they have to come up with an argument that says, well, no, actually, um, you're wrong and I'd like you to leave me alone. Now, um, there are some some good ideological arguments in support of gun ownership, which I think it's worthwhile um, gun owners knowing about, even if they don't use them. One is um, socialist. Um, probably not that many people in the room would use this argument, but there is a, a good argument that used to be quite common amongst socialists, that the working class needed guns to defend themselves against the bosses. The capitalists, the, the, um, the bourgeoisie, as the Marxists would, would uh, say it, the proletariat and the working class were oppressed by the bourgeoisie, by the ruling class. Um, the bourgeoisie control the police, the military. How are the working class going to defend themselves against uh, oppression? Um, and uh, how are they going to resist um, the oppression of the, uh, of the bourgeoisie, of the, of the ruling class. Ultimately, when push comes to shove, they can only do that if they're armed. And of course, that, that was the case in Russia in the communist revolution. 
the revolution of uh, 1917, when uh, when the um, uh, the Communist Party took power, they used guns. They seized the um, the members of the uh, the parliament at the time, the Russian parliament at the time. It wasn't a universal franchise at that time, but it was there was a, a version of a, an elect, elected democracy. They seized them. Um, they took over the um, the parliament. They captured the um, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the the Tsar and the Tsarina and their family. They held them at gunpoint. In fact, ultimately they they assassinated them with guns. So there's this precedent for uh, the uh, communists to use guns to take power from the bourgeoisie, the ruling class, and clearly. There is a socialist argument that says, well, if the working class is disarmed, how are they ever going to rise up against the bourgeoisie? How are they ever going to take back power from the ruling class? And if you listen to the Greens, the Communist Party, the Socialist Party, Antifa, um, and various aspects, you know, the um, socialist running dogs, I sometimes call them, um, who hang around with, uh, with the left of the party, uh, the, the left of uh, those, those parties, um, you hear them talk in, in Marxist terms of the, the ruling class and the oppressed and who are the victims of the ruling class and who are the rulers. It's all corporate this or big government that or something like that. And yet then, 30 seconds later, they'll say, oh, but those of us who are oppressed, we shouldn't have guns. So that's where the inconsistency comes in. So they're right, right up until the point where they say, yeah, there's a ruling class, we've got to overthrow the ruling class. But then say, yeah, but we can't, we can't let them have guns to overthrow, over, overthrow the ruling class. Uh, they've all got to be disarmed. And, and it didn't used to be the way. It used to be, within my memory, that some of the most uh, um, dedicated supporters of uh, in, individuals, working class people having guns, were socialists. That's all dead now. The socialists have basically abandoned the idea of, uh, of any, any semblance of revolution, any idea of taking back power from who they regard as the, working, as the ruling class. But there is an ideological argument with historical precedent for uh, socialism being in favour of the working class having guns. And uh, uh, you know, you self-define yourself if you're working class, but I'd say most of us are. The argument that I prefer uh, isn't a socialist argument, funnily enough. Um, it's the libertarian argument. The Liberal Democratic Party, my party, is based on libertarian principles. And libertarian, uh, the libertarian argument is that the government is our servant, not our master. The government is there to serve us. We are not there to serve it. And if, if the government has all the guns and we don't, then how on earth can it possibly be our servant? If we're the ones who are disarmed and the government has all the guns, how can we possibly force the government to um, act in accordance with our wishes? Whenever they feel like it, they can say, no, the hell with you, point a gun at you and you're in trouble. They can lock you up, you've got nothing to do, nothing to... Um, uh, to resist with. Now, this, this is a very long-standing, deep-seated argument um, in philosophical terms. And you, you, there are lots of people who've written about this, you know, the basis of this sort of argument um, in history. And it, it goes right back to a consideration of where do we get our rights from? Do so right to free speech, forget about gun rights for a moment. Where do we get our right to free speech from? Where, where do we get our right to freedom of religion or freedom of association? <coughs> Equality before the law. Those sort of rights we take for granted in a liberal democracy such as Australia. We think that they are, they are um, rights by all means, but where do we get them from? Do we get them from the government or are they ours? Um, just by being people, just by being citizens of a free society. Now this is a, a, a long-standing philosophical argument and you can trace it back, uh, 
uh, probably in retrospect, we can trace it back to two Scottish philosophers, um, philosophers and economists, Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. Um, one or two of you may have heard me discuss this before, but uh, um, if you have, then you'll just have to hear me say it again. Um, Thomas Hobbes is the author of um, the saying, life is nasty, brutish, and short. His view was that in his natural state, man, man including women, um, was at permanent war. That, that in the absence of government, or leadership, yeah, government basically, um, man is, is permanently at war. And, and without government, um, we'd all kill each other. And uh, his view for avoiding that situation was that the only way that, that would work is for us all to relinquish our rights, what it, relinquish our freedoms, not rights because rights are different, relinquish all our freedoms, basically uh, throw ourselves uh, on the good uh, goodwill of the sovereign, and they used to talk about the sovereign in those days being the king or the queen or whoever was in charge, not an elected government as we have now. So we throw ourselves on the government um, or the sovereign and the sovereign would then give us back our rights uh, in accordance with whatever the sovereign thought was a good thing. So um, they would allow us to operate, to make money, to, to live and to do all those sorts of things. But the point was that Without the sovereign agreeing to those things, they wouldn't exist. So we only had rights to the extent that the sovereign gave them to us. And if the sovereign said, well, you haven't got that right anymore and took it back, that was the sovereign's right. Now, by that logic, we don't have any rights other than what the government gives us. So if you equate that to gun laws, um, this is... Um, where the idea comes from that gun ownership is a privilege, that it's not a right. And that's in our law, that uh, the government's basically entitled to take back any freedoms that it thinks we, we are entitled to and say, no, you haven't got them, I've taken them back. So that, that derives from that attitude that Thomas Hobbes wrote about, um, which, uh, uh, which goes right back to the 17th century uh, Scotland. Now, the alternative to that, um, I am oversimplifying it, but the, the alternative to that is John Locke. John Locke's view was that uh, we humans uh, get on pretty well, pretty peaceful in the natural state. We don't really need a government at all to speak of. And we're not at war. We are peaceful, industrious, we work. But um, it's difficult to protect private property and establish a civilised society without a government. And so therefore, uh, the way you solve that is we as individuals hand over a certain amount of our freedom to the sovereign, the government, and in order to protect private property and maintain a civilised society. But if that if we hand over our, those rights to the government, it's, it's a conditional thing. We can take them back if we want to. And if the government starts getting too bolshy about uh, using those rights that we handed over to, to the government, um, then we can say, right, oh, we don't like that anymore. You, know, you, can't, you can't continue using them. They're ours. They're not the government's. So in other words, the, the, and the conclusion you come to is our right to own guns doesn't come from the government under this way of thinking. Our right to own guns is ours. It's born. Some people might call it a natural right, an inherent right. Um, in America, there's quite a lot of people who say it's God-given. Whatever. Whatever turns you on. But it's not, it's not for the government to give to us. It's ours. We hand over a, a certain amount of our liberty to the government to maintain civilised society, protect property and so forth. But the source of that, that discretion we give the government comes from us. It's not the government giving us discretion. So that's the libertarian argument, and I, I am unmistakably in the camp of John Locke, as you might expect. So is the American Declaration of Independence. 
you will probably be familiar with some of it, um, that uh, all men are, are, are uh, I think that quote fails me, all men are created equal or something, and we have inherent rights, have inherent rights. The Declaration of Independence is quite, quite profound. It says we all have inherent rights. And, and uh, that was very, very heavily influenced by the thinking of John Locke. Governments are not to be trusted. You give them only as much power as is necessary to maintain a civilised society, but you don't trust them ever with it. And you may have heard um, Thomas Jefferson's quote, in fact, the tree of liberty has to be refreshed from time to time with the blood of tyrants and patriots. In other words, every now and then governments get way too controlling and the power has to be taken back from them. You hope that it doesn't require blood. But, um, but nonetheless, that's the thinking behind it. Now, that's, that's the libertarian argument. Um, now others, you don't have to be a libertarian to subscribe to that, of course. Um, but uh, that's where I am at, at with, my, um, with my political party. So it is very important, to, from my point of view, to understand the relationship between us as individual gun owners and the government. Do we think the government gives us our power to have guns? or our right to have guns? Or do we think we've got that right and the government's just messing with it? Now, us libertarians, we're very much of the view the government needs to be small, um, rarely seen, hardly ever heard, keep its hand out of our pocket and off our back, out of our bedroom, all of those sorts of things that we get on pretty much um, without the government most of the time. Occasionally we need the government to uh, uh, catch criminals, um, stop people from stealing our property, national defence, that sort of stuff. But, you know, there's, there's pretty strict limits on what we think the government um, uh, can legitimately do. Now, obviously, they do a hell of a lot more than that, a hell of a lot more than that. And us libertarians, we don't like that, the amount that they intrude into our lives. And the idea that the government can have all the guns and we can't have all the guns is just absolutely contrary to this idea that the government is there to service we're in charge of the government, not vice versa, and that if we ever wanted to take power back from the government, um, we'd never be able to do it with, uh, with uh, the government having all the guns. Now, not that I'd ever want to encourage that, that sort of approach, but in Australia we, we'd probably all go to the beach before we'd worry about a revolution. Um, we, don't have to, we'd, we shouldn't try and pretend that we in Australia are unique in uh, not having a difficulty with overbearing governments. So my point on this is that rights matter, and it's not just gun rights. The gov there are people who, who are uh, harassed, oppressed, um, vilified by the government, uh, who aren't, shoot aren't shooters. They're also harassed and, and uh, vilified by the government. I'm thinking perhaps of smokers. Um, very, very vilified group of people. And. The issue about doing harm to other people can be dealt with by the secondary smoking laws, regulations, and yet they still get harassed to death. Not well, to their death probably, they smoke. But, um, and this, this then brings me to the principle, when is it legitimate for the government to intrude? When is it legitimate for the government to pass laws and regulations that impede our ability to do what we like? And there is a principle called the harm principle which uh, originates from John Stuart Mill, who is generally regarded as the, the uh, uh, father of liberalism, liberalism being small l, um, who said the only time that uh, governments can legitimately impose on uh, us as uh, people is, w is to prevent harm to others. Prevent harm to others. So clearly, those of us with guns, the government can stop us from hurting somebody else and we should never quarrel with that. But if we're not hurting anybody else, the issue is should they be able to um, impose their will on us when no one's going to get hurt. And of course, you know, we, we know that uh, the laws really don't make any difference to that. Wouldn't matter whether the laws were uh, much, much slacker than they are now, we wouldn't hurt anybody with our guns anyway. That's the point. So what are they achieving? It's bad in principle anyway. Now, um, 
why is gun control growing, notwithstanding? We've got some very, very strong arguments for why it shouldn't be growing. Well, it, that derives, in my opinion, from the same, the same sort of issues that I was just describing about, um, uh, about governments going well beyond what we as libertarians think governments ought to do. We have a massive growth of government onto just about every area of life. There is hardly an area of life where the government doesn't stick its nose and, and its finger. The solution is government in most cases. Even when the problem was created by the government, most of the time the solution is more government. The government can fix things. Things are not going very well, therefore the government needs to step in and fix it. And I suppose you could look at the energy market, you know, electricity. You know, the, the current situation where we've got intermittent power from solar and uh, wind, um, unreliable power, uh, so unreliable that it goes off in South Australia, um, and nobody's building uh, baseload power stations, whether it's coal or gas, because um, they can't see that, they are, uh, that it's a good investment. All of that is due to the government. So what's the government's solution? More government intrusion into the market. More government getting involved in telling the electricity market how to operate. That's a classic example, but you see it over and over again. Now, one of the areas in which governments have thought they've been doing a good job, and we can't argue with it when it, when it began, was in the area of public health. Sanitation, getting sewage you know, out of the, the, uh, the old dunny can down the back and into sewage pipes, that helped. Uh, clean water, keeping the water separate from the sewage so that uh, cholera didn't get a go on, that helped save many, many lives. And then we see that in the countries where they don't have that. Every now and then they get cholera and typhoid outbreaks and things like that. Drainage, drain, uh, drain all the, um, the dog poo away and, and uh, human poo and whatever else that might make us sick, get it away from us. We don't get sick, we live longer. It's done, done uh, wonders for... Um, uh, uh, for the death rate. Air pollution as well, nowhere near as significant, but nonetheless, there used to be um, abattoirs, uh, tanneries, um, all sorts of factories of various kinds spewing out um, uh, chemicals and dust and so forth that weren't very good for our health. And I would, I would argue the government's gone a bit uh, obsessed about in some areas on that. But the broad general direction has been an improvement in our overall health. And then on a broad basis, you can say, well, the government has improved public health in, in some other aspects, such as vaccination. Children don't die from common diseases all that much anymore. Fluoridation, our teeth don't rot quite so badly. And, of course, they've introduced things such as compulsory education. Um, kids have to go to school, or at least be educated. They mostly go to school. And then, then there's been the whole industry about warning people. Um, warning people don't smoke, um, warning people to, uh, to take precautions with the uh, aspects of their lives. Now, I suppose you could argue for most of us that if it had stopped there, um, you know, we could probably tolerate it. We might grumble a little bit, but, but of course it didn't stop there. So it then extended into the nanny state. We have now um, rules, regulations, taxes, nudging of various kinds in relation to smoking. We've got the most expensive cigarettes in the world because of taxes. Drinking. We've got very high alcohol taxes in this country. There's a few countries that are more expensive and not many. Gambling. We've got uh, quite high taxes, lots of rules and regulations. You can't ride a bicycle without a helmet. One of only two or three countries in the whole world where a compulsory, it's compulsory to wear a helmet riding a bicycle. The rest of the world, they get by fine without it, but not us. Swimming pools. You've got to have a fence around your pool. And in New South Wales, you have to register your pool. And if you don't, you'll get prosecuted. If you've been reading the, the paper lately, I'm one of those people who uh, is being prosecuted. Now, where's it going? Well, we hear almost every week calls for taxes on sugar. Now, there's probably a connection between sugar and being fat, but it's, the, the, the jury is a bit out on that. 
And um, there is absolutely no good evidence that making sugar more expensive stops people getting fat. It does reduce people from eating certain types of sugar, the ones that have the tax on it, but that doesn't necessarily mean they eat less sugar overall. And particularly, there's no evidence that they uh, lose weight or that fewer people get fat. So, so we're heading into uh, controlling what we eat. And of course, we've had education programs for a long time on, edu on exercise. And so uh, the norm campaigns, we could all remember them, I suppose. And it became a, a pejorative to call somebody norm if they sat around watching TV. And uh, so it's not, it's not beyond the, um, our imagination to think we go from um, spending our money to tell us what's good for us to forcing us to do what's good for us. That's, that's the link. Now, one of the justifications for that, of course, is what we, we know as socialised medicine. So we socialise the cost of being sick or injured. And um, so if I smoke, and as a result I make myself sick, um, and I have to be treated in a hospital, um, uh, the cost of that is shared amongst all of you, most of whom I would suggest probably don't smoke. And people will say, but therefore you shouldn't smoke. That argument, of course, is extended across a whole lot of things. And the reality is, if none of us drove over 20 kilometres an hour, none of us drank alcohol, none of us smoked, um, none of us uh, uh, ate too much, all of us got out and did um, 5Ks of uh, jogging or running or whatever every day, um, it's quite likely um, we would all be a little bit healthier, live a little bit longer, a bit less, uh, not as sick, and health bills might fall down. So the question is, though, at what point is it the government's business? At what point do we let our socialised medicine um, drive the way we live? Does that give justification to the government to tell us how to live because we socialise our health costs? Now, if you can imagine a, a situation without socialised health cost, you would have insurance and and the cost of your insurance might depend on what your risk factors were. So it, the government was out of it. So if I was a smoker and I wanted health insurance, the insurer might say, well, your premium is 20% more than it would be if you didn't smoke. I can then make my own decision. Do I quit smoking and get cheaper insurance or do I pay up and keep smoking? The same might go for all sorts of things, skydiving, base jumping, um, spearfishing, um, surfing when there are sharks around, you know, where does it end? Pregnant women, um, uh, that we're told they shouldn't drink alcohol. Well, one year they're told they shouldn't drink alcohol, the next year they're told a bit of alcohol is okay. So, you know, they can never make up their mind, but you get the idea. Where does it end? And my argument is that it's, it really isn't the government's business, it's between, it, well, it's our business, and if we want to do something uh, ourselves to reduce our, um, our risks, we can. We should benefit from that via lower health insurance. But our, our choices about how we live should not be determined by a socialised uh, health system, socialised medicine. Now. All this is leading to why is gun control growing? We are talking about consideration of guns and the fact that they can be misused in the context of um, an increasing government involvement in our lives, increasing government certainty that they know what's good for us, and the characterization of gun misuse as a public health issue. It's also uh, at times seen as a nanny state issue, um, a socialised health issue. So they can control guns. So their argument is, well, there'll be less gun violence, so therefore be the less, less, host, uh, less cost to the socialised health system. Um, you don't know what's good for you, uh, therefore, and we do, therefore we are entitled to tell you not to have a gun. 
that's nanny state. Um, there are uh, any number of arguments within the socialised health system argument, the public health system argument, and the government knows best philosophy that is so common in this country and, and other countries as well, that uh, gun control can fit under any of those. And you'll hear the gun control advocates pulling from one or other of those arguments whenever they're advocating gun control. They will characterise it as a public health issue, although they'll characterise it as um, we know better than you, that you as shooters are all too stupid to know what's good for you, they know what's good for you, and they'll tell you how to live your life. That's nanny state stuff. Um, you'll hear that all the time. Or you'll even just hear a straight out authoritarian, the government's got every right to decide who can have a gun and when, and it will decide. And it has decided, and you don't get one. That's, that's the classic uh, Thomas Hobbes uh, view of thinking. Whatever rights you think you've got, um, the government can take them back any time they like. That's the Thomas Hobbes philosophy. It goes way back, as I said, to the 17th century um, Scotland. So it's, it's, uh, uh, there's, a, there's deep roots uh, in, uh, in this gun control issue, deep philosophical roots. And if you think it's just guns, you're, not, you're wrong. It's not just, not just. Now, what goes with that, of course, to make it easier to control guns, to, um, to say, well, you haven't got a right to a gun, or you're not safe with a gun, or uh, you know, whatever, uh, ju whatever justification they come up with for saying you shouldn't have a gun, they are demonising them. They're saying guns are bad, and K, as Mr Mackey would say about drugs. No South Park fans here, by the looks. Um, um, so guns are bad. Now, what guns are particularly bad? Oh, assault rifles. They're really, really bad. No one knows what an assault rifle is, but we all know they're bad, don't we? Rapid firing guns. They're really bad, because if they're rapid firing, of course, you can kill more people more rapidly. Everyone knows that. No one's ever actually explained how the hell you're supposed to aim the damn things when you're firing them so rapidly. But, um, but nonetheless, we all know that's, that's the case. And military style, that makes them worse if they're military style. We can't quite work out what military style means either. But if you put military style, rapid firing, assault rifle together, oh, you don't have to say anything else. It's so obvious that, you know, shouldn't be allowed. Should not be allowed. This demonisation of guns is, uh, is, is a big thing. And, you know, you'd... you'd, you'd you see that, I'll talk about this a little bit uh, later, but you see that even in appearance laws now, that it's really not the, what the gun does, um, what might be done with it, it's, it's the look of it. It's the um, it, you know, gun culture is, is uh, a bad thing. Um, a fondness for guns is, is frequently characterised as some kind of mental failing. And uh, the normal state is no guns. And this comes ab about because of uh, demonisation. It's not as, gun ownership is not as demonised as being a pedophile, but you know, you can see the trend. Now, the fact is in Australia, we are losing the argument. Um, and the examples that, that um, confirm that would be the Battle Over the Adler. Um, we lost that. Uh, notwithstanding the fact that we fought very, very hard over it. Um, we now have uh, a shotgun for no good reason, um, classified in Category B if it's up to five rounds and in D if it's more than five rounds. No good reason whatsoever. I mentioned appearance laws. We're seeing this more and more. Guns are being judged not on what they do but what they look like. Now, I'm, again, I'll, I'll talk about this a bit more, but I, I've been trying to do something about that. But uh, um, my influence is in the federal parliament at the moment, and, uh, and I, although I've been making a little bit of progress on that issue there, the states seem to be doing their own thing on it, and we're, so we're, we're fighting little spot fires state by state by state. And, of course, we know about the changes to the National Firearms Agreement, godforsaken bloody document if ever there was one, and um, uh, the fact that the bureaucrats can convince the stupid politicians 
National Firearms Agreement is a good thing and we should all worship at the altar of the NFA and we just do some technical changes, some technical changes to the NFA, it's still all good. Everything is just hunky-dory. Now we are also losing, well us shooters are also losing the battle in the EU. If you haven't been paying attention, um, the EU has just recently adopted EU-wide uh, gun control and, um, against semi-automatics. Um, it's causing some consternation. I have a good friend who lives in Switzerland um, and even Switzerland is signing up to it because they're frightened of getting kicked out of the free trade agreement with uh, the EU. Now this is, this is the home of um, the, the um, every, every gun, every house has a gun um, place. Um, this is the home of uh, them all doing military service, taking home their service semi, uh, semi full automatic rifle, ammunition at home. They're all in the, basically the militia as we would call it, and uh, and being allowed to keep that when they finish their service. Um, so there's a, a an automatic rifle, a Swiss made automatic rifle, in most houses, as a matter of fact. And when you drive around Switzerland, you go through these little villages. Practically every one of them's got a rifle range pretty close to the middle of the town. It's all baffled, of course, perfectly safe, but shooting is a massive sport. And yet here they are adopting these EU bans on semi-automatic firearms. Um, they will get around it um, by having uh, a permit system, it seems. But the pressure's on. The pressure is on. Now that's not happening. That, that sort of uh, um, stepping backwards is not happening in America. America has concealed carry and it's now in, uh, yeah, no, I don't think it's 50, I think 43 states I think it is, something like that. Anyway, quite a lot, a lot. Um, uh, an increasing number of states are allowing open carry, which I'm not sure that's a good thing because I think it defeats the purpose, but anyway, they're, they're doing it. And, um, and permitless carry. A number of states had permitless carry forever, but increasingly there are uh, more, more and more of them. And, and of course we've got Donald Trump who is, um, uh, un unusually he used to be uh, in favour of gun control back when he was a Democrat, but now he's a Republican, he's dead against gun control. So let's hope he stays a Republican. Uh, but anyway, so far so good with Trump. Uh, the other country where uh, gun control is not advancing is Brazil. Brazil had a, a referendum on, uh, gun, on whether to introduce gun control a few years ago and it was defeated. And of course the, uh, the gun control lobby all bleated and carried on about it, but um, uh, that didn't make any difference. So, so, but we are losing, we are losing here in Australia. So what can we do about it? There's a number of things that can be done and I suppose what I want to emphasise is there's no one thing. I am forever hearing from people who say, if only we did so and so, then we could fix it. There is no one thing. There is no you know, simple answer. It's a complicated, long-term, um, multifaceted problem requiring multifaceted solutions. And it's not just about politicians like me or leaders of organisations like Graham. It's going to require all of us. We aren't going to win if we let others do it. So some, some simple things. Expand the shooting sports. The more people are involved, the, uh, the harder it is for politicians to gang up on them, make their life hard. The, um, uh, the statistics on gun ownership in Australia are interesting. We often hear it trotted out that there are 800,000 gun owners in Australia. In fact, I think it's closer to 2 million. There's a, uh, a, an agency that collects, a federal government agency that collects figures from the, um, um, each of the state uh, police departments on, uh, on licence numbers and it's that they say it's close to two million. So there's a lot of us and if we all work together, 
well, not all work together, if we all work to the same purpose. We're never going to work together. The only thing we agree on, most likely, is we like shooting. So we should be careful about trying to um, encourage each other to agree on other stuff. We won't. But we all agree that we are legitimate owners of firearms and we don't do anybody any harm. We've got a legitimate reason to do it and we don't like the government intruding into that. So as long as we all remember that's the side we're on, um, we, and the more of us there are, the better our, chance, our chances are of fighting back against this, this gun control wave. So expanding the shooting sports, expanding hunting um, is, is a no-brainer. Bring people into the sport. I don't know, I, over and over again, when I've introduced people to shooting or I've known about them to try shooting um, and they've told me about it, it only takes a little, uh, you know, a half-hour session of uh, firing a gun, hitting the target, and you see the biggest grin on their face. They just love it. And, uh, and quite a few of them say, yep, I like doing this. This is fun. Others say, yep, that's good. I can see why you enjoy it, but I've got other things I want to do. But they, they're not opposed anymore because they realise that it's, um, you know, it's good fun and, and they appreciate why we like doing it. So expand the shooting sports, hunting sports. You do need to make sure you support pro-shooting and pro-hunting politicians. And um, that's not parties, if I can emphasise that. That is not necessarily parties. Within parties, you have people who are good on the, on the uh, guns issue and people who are not good. You do need to look at the individuals. And how do you do that? And that's not as easy as it sounds. In America, they can look at their voting record in the Democrats and the Republicans and judge them by their voting record. I was in America um, last year and talking to um, Rand Paul, Thomas Massey, um, um, and, and they were telling me, I uh, can't remember which one it was, was telling me, they forced some issues on guns to come to a vote. Um, because it's the only way of flushing out the people who say the right thing and then won't vote the right way. And so they use their voting record then to rate them and, and let, let shooters know um, what those ratings are. <coughs> now, um, and that, that's a useful thing to do, but here in Australia we have, that, have the problem that they, are, um, they all vote pretty much according to their party's position. And it's actually... Um, dangerous for their career as a politician to vote against their party position. So even though um, there might be a Labor member who is strongly supportive of shooting, and there are some of course, um, if the Labor Party says we are going to ban guns, that the only way that person can vote against that uh, uh, is by sacrificing their seat in Parliament. And unlike me, I, I don't need the money, um, I don't need the job. If I wasn't a politician, I'd be happily retired. Um, uh, most of those people are not in that position. Most of them need the job, most of them need the money, most of them are des desperate to stay in it. And so therefore, they will put that before they will put uh, their, um, their attitude to, uh, to firearms. So you need to go politician by politician. And it isn't all that easy. Um, and it's a good idea to um, uh, obviously to look and pay attention to what others have said about them, what they've said themselves, and, uh, and you know, what, what we can say uh, is, is their true position. And I'll give you an example of the, uh, the sort of stuff that can be done. The National Party, now up here in Queensland you have the LNP um, as a merged party, but they all still, as I think all of them still, identify as either Liberal or National. So the National Party, they will say, oh, yeah, we're, we're, we're really very keen on shooting. We love shooting. We think it's great. And then you'll say to them, okay, well, what do you think of the National Firearms Agreement? Yeah, we wouldn't want it to get any worse. Well, what about removing it? What about the Commonwealth getting out of firearms control? Oh, well, uh, and then, then that's when you start to realise, okay, well, you're better than a green, but it's all relative. So you've got to hold these politicians to account. You've got to look at what they do as well as what they say. How did they vote? 
Um, you can often find out how they vote in a party room, uh, look at what they do. When there is an anti-gun uh, proposal on the table, did they do anything to stop it? Did they make any representations? Did they write any letters? Did they go and see the minister responsible? Um, did they threaten to cross the floor? Uh, did, did they you know, really uh, fight for, um, uh, on, this, on this issue? And I have to say, the vast majority of them are all, yeah, I say this, they're all piss and wind. It's mostly talk. And that includes the nationals. And of course the liberals, you get a few liberals who are actual shooters themselves. And if you know that, that's good, because mostly they're okay if they are an active shooter. But there's a lot of them who will say, yeah, I think shooting's fine. What do you think of the National Firearms Agreement? Oh, yeah, it's got a few gaps, but you know, you know, we fix the subject to that. Um, and of course the Labor people, they are either ban all guns or they might be shooters and they shut up about it. There's a few Labor people who are shooters and if you can find out who they are, they're worth supporting as well. Now, um, uh, an area that sh I'm not very keen on the government funding sport, but that's just me, uh, Liberal Democrats. Given that the uh, government does fund sport, you should always argue for a fair share for shooting. Shooting is a legitimate sport. If money is being handled out for sport, um, make sure uh, shooting gets some. That will build, build support, um, will bring more people into it, it will allow it to get publicity, um, attract attention, do all the good things. So uh, never let a chance go by there. Now I argue against government funding sport full stop. I think governments should do a lot less. But um, if they are going to fund it, then they should fund shooting alongside the other sports. Um, the obvious no-brainers, uh, shooters, we should work in the same direction. I mentioned that before. Um, we don't all have to agree. We don't all have to be on the same side. We don't all have to hold hands and go on. But we should all understand that when it comes to shooting, we are on the same side. I am really, really over seeing shooters ripping into each other. There's nothing to be gained by that. Um, we are on the same side. Even when we disagree on tactics, we are still on the same side. So stay in touch with each other, coordinate where you can, and certainly don't bugger up, bugger up each other's activities. Now, a lot of people think uh, debating the issue is a key to it. Um, talk about legitimacy, talk about facts, um, uh, you know, put the facts on the table, um, the statistics are on our side. The Howard gun laws did nothing to change the downward exist, pre-existing downward trend in, uh, in uh, firearm murders, nothing at all. Did nothing to change the suicide rate. There was some suggestion that people stopped shooting themselves as much and killed themselves in other ways, but the number of people dying um, didn't change at all. Um, in fact, if anything, the suicide rate has stayed steady for the last 20 years and it's most, the, the worst uh, or the heart rate is highest amongst uh, men of my age and a number of your ages in this room. We, we are the age group that tops ourselves most often. If we have a gun, the likelihood is we might do it with a gun, but if we don't have a gun, we'll find another way to do it. The issue is why do we want to do it in the first place and we don't know the answer to that. Um, we really do need to find that out. But um, facts obviously are, are important. But this argument is not fundamentally about facts and data. If it was, we would have won it a long, long time ago. The facts are on our side. It's an emotional argument. Guns feel bad. Guns kill people. They've only got one purpose. You know, how often have you heard that claptrap? Um, it's an emotional argument. The AR-15 is black. That makes it bad. I sometimes tweeted a pink one just to sort of set the, the uh, loonies off a bit. And uh, it does too. It works them. Um, and, uh, uh, and I've even got uh, a, a meme with a black AR-15 and, the, and this, the caption is, it's because I'm black, isn't it? I quite like doing that one occasionally, just to liven the debate a bit. But um, I mean, what I'm—the point I'm trying to make is that 
relying on facts, relying on data is not going to do it. We are not going to win that. In fact, we're not going to win it by just claiming we do no harm. We are not going to do that. Uh, people are not interested enough to support us. We're not going to win it by saying, but sport's a wonderful thing and sports should be supported. We're not going to win the debate on that. We are going to win it on the basis of emotion. If we are going to win it, we will win it on the basis of emotion. So that will, that will require using emotional arguments. And we'll win it, if we're going to win it, on the basis of self-defence. And mainly women and mainly on emotional grounds. Now that's where the NRA is succeeding in America. They've brought in lots and lots of women with guns and they are pushing women with guns all the time. And they are not arguing statistics, they are arguing emotion. They are arguing self-defence. You know, the, the, um, uh, there's a picture of a woman with a gun, <coughs> uh, without a gun. Somebody is trying to break into her house and the caption says, when seconds count, the police are minutes away. In other words, if she had a gun, we wouldn't be needing the police to turn up so quickly. That's the kind of emotional argument that will turn the tide. Now, we don't, I don't think we can go, I've tested the water a little bit myself on, on guns for self-defence in this country. And I, I never back away from that, but uh, as a pistol shooter myself, I'm also well aware of the fact that there's an awful lot of people who are not safe for the bloody pistol. And I don't want everybody having a pistol. Or you know, even a shotgun for that matter, but pistols are, they're, you know, there, is a, there is a need to know what you're doing. If you do know what you're doing, they're fine. I've got no problem with that, men or women. But um, they're obviously not for everybody. Plus, if you've ever had to carry one around, you know they're heavy and they're a nuisance. Uh, frankly, they're a nuisance. And uh, if I lived in America and I had a permit to carry one around, I'd buy the smallest one I could find. It's just such a pain in the ass to drag the damn things around. So what, what's the answer? In Australia, arguing for guns for self-defence, other than in the home, I think it's, too, it's a bridge too far. I don't think we will win that argument, uh, at least not until we win intermediate arguments first. So a, a gun in the home, perhaps, the, the right to have a gun in your house for self-defence, we might win that argument, but not certainly not carry. What we might win, though, what we could win, and we all need to start uh, uh, pursuing, in my opinion, is non-lethal means of self-defence. Um, airsoft is an area that I've been pushing pretty hard. Um, unfortunately, it's primarily a state issue, but we have a member, a Liberal Democrats member in the Western Australian Parliament. He's been pushing it, and he's quite confident he's going to win. He's got the police minister on board. They're just they're working on the details on that, and I have I alerted Angus Taylor and his department to the fact that as soon as the um, uh, Western Australians decide to approve it, the Feds have to drop their ban on the importation of the equipment. That's quite important. Otherwise, it'll be a fairly fruitless um, uh, change. And uh, there are people getting harassed over kids' toys, plastic guns, water pistols, gel blasters, that sort of stuff. A lot, often, or much of it is at a state level, not much I can do about that, <coughs> unless it's in WA, where I can get our guy over there to look at it, but not much so far has occurred. But uh, there is a little bit of it coming out of home affairs, and uh, I, can, uh, I can sometimes help with that. And then finally, I thought, uh, I've been asked most places I've spoken recently about Sarah. Um, yeah. So I'm, I am, in my opinion, Sarah has only done this in order to help her chances of getting pre-selected by the Greens or elected for the Greens in South Australia. She did very, very badly in the last election, only just got elected on a double dissolution, only just made it across the line. The chances of her building her vote um, enough to win at the next election, which will be a normal half Senate election, are not all that good. So in my opinion, she, she may well be out of the parliament. 
but she knows that, of course, and, um, uh, and I think, in my opinion, that's the reason she's pursuing this. Um, the, the f I, there are many examples in which she has collectively blamed men for lots of things. Um, she's into um, identity politics, um, gender identity, um, and so she think she argues she's speaking on behalf of women, and uh, and she collectively attributes bad things to men. Um, she's heterosexual and and uh, uh, obviously has relationships with men. Um, what I pointed out was hypocrisy. If you think men are collectively responsible for bad things, and in this case it was the rape and murder of the woman. Eurydice Dixon in Melbourne, then it is hypocritical of you to be having relationships with them. I made no comment about how many men she has relationships with or what kind of relationships they are. Um, all this slut shaming stuff is her invention. Um, I, I made no reference to um, you know what uh, what her sexual appetites might be, big or small. But uh, but I did say that she's hypocritical. I did say also that she is misandrist. Misandrist is the uh, other side of the coin from misogynist. Misogynist is someone who doesn't like women or is negative about women. And misandrist is someone who does has those assigns those attributes to men. I believe she's a, a misandrist, and I also believe she's a hypocrite. They are the two grounds on which she is suing me for defamation. We we sought to have the action dismissed, thrown out um, at a, what's called interlocutory process, just on the basis that it was seeking to Im impeach or Im impinge on uh, parliamentary privilege, because the, uh, the main issue arose from, from what was said inside parliament. That failed at first instance. We've just lodged an appeal on that. Um, uh, but in any case, even if, whether, if, that success, if that succeeds, then That'll be the end of it, and she'll have to pay my costs. If um, if it doesn't succeed, it will then go on to uh, a hearing, a trial, unless she wants to pull out. And she can't do that without without my agreement. So it's not a matter of her just walking away and leaving me with it. She can't do that. Now, if it goes through to a full hearing, she has to establish a number of things. One, that being called a misandrist and a hypocrite is defamatory. In other words, her reputation was damaged. So she has to establish that she had a reputation um, prior to what I said, which didn't include hypocrisy or misandry. And after I said it, it does include hypocrisy and misandry. She has to establish that. And then she has to establish that what I said doesn't come under any of the defences available in defamation, and they include truth. So. Um, Political free speech, of course, opinion, and, and one or two others. I can't remember what they are. So she has to establish that none of them apply. Now, uh, good luck, in my opinion. I, I am confident that uh, she won't win. Uh, so are my lawyers. Um, uh, she can't walk away um, and leave me with the costs without my agreement. Um, the only way she'll get me, she can get me to pay costs, is by winning completely. Um, I, am, I am totally confident that she'll end up uh, paying me a lot more money than, uh, than she's paying her own lawyers. So that's, that's where that's at. Now, um, it's got a long way to play out. Um, I wonder whether she will be as interested in pursuing it um, after the election, after the federal election, as she is now. I suspect that her attitude might change. But she can't just walk away, except with my agreement. All right. I think I've probably said enough there for one day, and uh, I'm happy to ask question, uh, answer questions. <clears throat> <clears throat>